Okay, welcome to the Airmere Roundtable. Today is the 5th of October, 2022. And a special guest, my uh, oldest son, Tim, who's uh, down in Austin, a software developer. But Tim's been really into crypto and trying to get uh, me interested and his brothers and sister and everybody he knows. He's really into crypto. So um, we thought it'd be nice if uh, Tim could do a presentation on uh, crypto to kind of get us on the first base of the crypto world. So Tim, uh, nice to have you on the round table. Thank you. Um, and thanks everybody for sharing your time with me today. Hopefully this is interesting. If you know about crypto already to some extent, maybe you can correct a mistake or, or two. Um, so it's nice to meet you guys. I'm Tim. Um, and by the way, feel free to drop questions in the chat. I'll either work those in as I go along or we can have some discussion at the end. Um, professionally, I'm a software engineer. So I have a background in building retail applications and consumer finance products. Crypto first caught my eye a few years ago as a retail investor. And I ended up drinking from the fire hose. And now I'm actively participating in a few different crypto communities. Um, for example, I'm an elected steward of an organization's treasury. It's a pretty small group. Um, and I'm informally advising a small startup in the blockchain gaming space. So it's kind of a wild west, and those things just tend to happen when you get involved. And crypto is a very big and open-ended space, and so this talk would be very different coming from somebody else. It's just my um, view into this world, and hopefully I can share a window of that uh, into that with you, and we can learn something interesting. So crypto, there are there are a lot of buzzwords around crypto. There are a lot of technical words that are even, even after spending some time in this space, they still take me a minute to figure out what exactly are we talking about. And really the question today around what is this presentation going to be about comes down to building a foundational understanding of what crypto actually encompasses. Um, and so that hopefully you're able to go explore it on your own with a little bit more confidence. The signal to noise ratio in crypto is very low. So there are like scams everywhere and it's really easy to get caught up in the wrong project or um, just kind of, it can be difficult to find good information. Um, okay, so enough setup, let's jump into it. And to start with, if you wanna understand anything at all about crypto, especially if you wanna have any kind of intuition, then it really helps to understand what a blockchain actually is. Um, so this will be slightly technical and maybe a little bit dry, but hopefully if we get through this, everything else will start to make a lot more sense. So bear with me here. The formal definition of a blockchain might be something like this, a digital database that is duplicated and distributed across a peer-to-peer -peer network. To unpack this a little bit, I want to go through maybe a contrived hypothetical scenario. So imagine you have a bunch of people in a shared space. Maybe it's just like a big room and everybody agrees that the money in their accounts is going to be kept track of by this set of ledgers. Okay, so there's a group of people. We have some of them here, Sally, Jean, Bob, Sam and some others, and anybody in the room is allowed to say, hey, I wanna do the job of maintaining and updating a copy of the ledger. And my copy is going to be the source of truth about who has how much money in their account, just as much as any other copy of the ledger. And it's important that all the copies match, of course, and, and are consistent, but anybody can do this job. So in this room, Sally, Jean, and Bob have volunteered to do this job. And as you'll see, they are incentivized to do this. And kind of the initial state of the ledger is that Bob has $100, Sally has $300, Sam has $50, and Jean has $80 in their accounts. So this is kind of day one, everybody's participating in this um, kind of decentralized ledger approach to managing and, and storing their finances. 
So let's say that Bob decides he wants to send some money to Sam. You might imagine that he could go to the front of the room, pull a piece of paper off of a clipboard and write in, I want to send $10 from Bob's account to Sam's account. And by the way, here's a 10 cent fee um, so that you guys actually go and update that record into the ledger. And very importantly, here's my signature so that you know this actually came from Bob and it's not like Sam trying to take Bob's money. So Bob drops his request into this box and out of all of the tickets in the box, it's now Jean's turn to, she's representing the group of accountants updating this ledger. It's now her turn to go find a ticket for them all to update their ledgers with. So she looks through the box and she sees, I like number 12, it comes with a nice fee. So I'm gonna choose this one. And she goes back to her ledger and she writes out some notes that show, okay, this is what everybody's new balance would be after processing this request from Bob. And she shares that with Sally and Bob and they all agree the math checks out. It's actually Bob's signature. So it's a valid request. And when they all agree, they add a new entry to the ledger that says um, Bob's balance is $10 and 10 cents lower. Sam's balance is $10 higher. And by the way, Gene got 10 cents in fees for doing that job. Uh, the next round, maybe it's Bob's turn to go find a new ticket and he'll get the fees. So basically, this is how most blockchains work. And just to impose some technical lingo on top of this diagram, um, entries in this uh, ledger, they're called blocks. And they don't have to include just a single transaction. They can actually include multiple transactions and tend to happen um, at fixed intervals of time. So every 15 seconds, maybe, there's enough room in the ledger to add, you know, maybe 30 different transactions. Those all get recorded, and then we go to the next iteration. Instead of tickets, um, requests in, to blockchains are called transactions, and fees are called gas fees. And gas kind of makes sense in terms of it being energy that you provide to this decentralized computer to keep it running and for things to actually happen, you need to provide an incentive um, to the network operators to continue processing transactions. And then lastly, Bob's signature on a digital blockchain would be like a digital signature from a cryptographic wallet that he's the only person in the world that's able to generate that. So it really is proof that that request is coming from him. Okay, so when you have this kind of um, situation, then there are a few challenges that, that come um, with it in terms of when you design like the actual software and the, the model for how all of this works. Specifically, consensus is really important because what happens if somebody submits an invalid transaction or forges somebody's signature? For example, how do you defend against somebody um, spending their money twice by making the same request um, from the same balance? And um, there's something called a 51% attack in crypto, which is this idea that if everybody who's updating the ledger is a computer, basically, um, what if I spend so much money that I add so many new computers to the network that I now have a majority and I can override everybody else's votes about what should happen. And therefore I can basically fake transactions to send everybody's money to me. So these are basically the hardest, these were the main obstacles um, that once solutions were found for these, they really enable blockchains to exist as they do today. Um, so just coming back to this question of how do you guarantee that consensus doesn't break down 
and that the network actually works the way that it's supposed to. So the two predominant cryptocurrencies right now are Bitcoin and Ethereum, and I'll talk a little bit more about this, but they, they now follow two different methods for achieving consensus. Um, Bitcoin uses proof of work. And basically what proof of work is, is it's a requirement where in order for me as a network operator to prove that my interests are aligned with the networks and I'm not going to be a bad actor, I'm going to spend a lot of money solving really hard math problems um, in order to have the right to update the ledger, update the blockchain. Um, so that's kind of the reason why Bitcoin uses a ton of energy. It actually uses half of 1% of all global energy at the moment. And the other model, proof of stake, is basically, um, it's like saying, I'm going to post a bond. I'm going to give you, I'm going to lock up some of my assets with you. And you can trust that I don't want to act against the best interests of the network, because if I do, those assets will potentially go to zero because um, they're based on the network. The value of them is based on the network actually doing what it's supposed to. So that's proof of stake. Um, Ethereum recently switched from proof of work to proof of stake and reduced the energy consumption um, of that network by the equivalent of roughly 15 nuclear reactors. So this is a big deal. Um, this is a big part of kind of the mainstream crypto narrative and debate and regulators are looking at this too. So just wanted to put those out there. That should be the last of the super, super technical stuff here. Okay, so I guess this is a little bit technical too. I just wanted to point out that blockchains tend to have different um, when you're designing a blockchain, if you're the creator of Bitcoin or the creator of Ethereum or the creator of Solana, you have choices in your design that are gonna, that are gonna lean in different directions. For example, um, Solana leans towards scalability by requiring really, really powerful computers, but that means that not your average person can buy one of those computers and participate in updating this ledger. So Solana is less decentralized than something like Bitcoin or Ethereum, but because of that high performance and scalability, their transactions can be much lower. Um, and for some applications, that might be more useful or more important. So just be aware that different blockchains, they tend to make trade-offs between uh, security in that some are easier to attack than others, um, scalability and decentralization, like I mentioned. So which blockchains are the most popular? Well, Bitcoin and Ethereum currently have about, well, over half of the entire public crypto market cap. Um, so for the purposes of this talk, we can mostly just focus on those, those two blockchains. And outside of Bitcoin and Ethereum, and out, outside of stable coins, which a few of them are listed here, and I'll explain what those are later, most of the other um, top blockchains here, like Solana and Cardano, they're basically alternatives to Ethereum where they, the approach is the same in terms of what they're trying to achieve, um, but the implementation is a bit different. Okay, so hopefully at this point, we have a bit of background in terms of what a blockchain is and how it is different from, for example, the, the database that your bank uses to keep track of how much money you have in your balance and, and that it's decentralized and distributed. So now we can talk about cryptocurrencies. And just to get some terminology out of the way, um, each blockchain typically has some kind of official currency, and that's called a coin. So Bitcoin is the coin associated with the Bitcoin blockchain. Ether, or ETH for short, is the coin associated with the Ethereum blockchain or Ethereum network. And in addition to the sort of native or official um, currencies of blockchains, some blockchains allow anybody to create um, a token, 
where token is just really another word for coin, but token is is more is generally used to describe non-official or non-native um, currencies that um, anybody can create at any time for any reason. So think of like a, a casino that somebody creates on the network. They might create their own casino chips, and those would be tokens that are specifically useful within the context of their online casino. Um, they, they might also be analogous to like county fair tickets. So they have value within the county fair, but outside of that, they're just paper. And one of the differences between kind of the real world poker chips and county fair tickets versus tokens on blockchains are that generally speaking, tokens can easily, easily be plugged into exchanges and made tradable um, with pretty much any other token very easily. And just to motivate this a little bit, because you might be wondering, like, why do blockchains need their own currencies? Why can't they use existing currencies like the dollar? Well, a useful metaphor for blockchains is really to think of them as economies where they actually have central banks. And the central bank monetary policy is like programmed into the software that people run when they update the ledger. So if the monetary policy for Ethereum was that, hey, we want to deflate the supply, then maybe every time there's a transaction and fees are collected, some of that um, currency gets destroyed in order to deflate the supply. And blockchain designers, they can basically implement arbitrary monetary, or monetary policies, but they wouldn't be able to do that if the medium of, medium of exchange was a fiat currency that, where like the US government was in control. So this metaphor of like a blockchain network as an economy with a central bank, I think that can stretch really, really far. And I'll come back to that at the very end of this um, talk. Um, okay, so just to recap, like what are the biggest cryptocurrencies? We mentioned a couple of them already. Um, I, I wanna point out what stable coins are here. So Bitcoin and Ethereum, they each have coins and then Tether and USD coin or USDC. Those are examples of stable coins. So those are tokens where businesses, in this case, the business Tether, the business Circle for USDC, they created these tokens out of thin air. And what they did was they basically minted one US dollar equivalent on a blockchain for every dollar that somebody deposited with them in the real world. So in this way, people have been able to bridge their dollars onto the blockchain um, and use them in decentralized finance, which I'll talk about. Lastly, I just want to um, point out the really critical difference between Bitcoin and the other popular blockchains, which is that Bitcoin's goal or design goal is really to be like a kind of digital gold. It's meant to be a scarce asset that preserves value and stores value. It's rock hard in that it's simple and resilient, but that's really all it's meant to do. The Ethereum network, in contrast, does have a token ETH or Ether, which can be a store of value and can be used as a medium of exchange, but you can also program you can program the value that exists on the network. So for example, going back to our illustration where Bob wants to send money to Sam, Bob on Ethereum could actually write rules into this um, transaction as a contract that says, for example, I agree to give this money to Sam, but only if his account balance is below $20, only if he really needs it. Or maybe he could say, I want to give this $10 to Sam, but only at a rate of $1 per day. And really anything goes here. Um, smart contracts are created from programming languages where you can basically do whatever you want. So this is kind of where the application space for um, crypto emerges. And I'll get into like what some of those applications are, but for now, just know that there's this fundamental difference between, um, for example, Bitcoin and Ethereum, where 
Ethereum is a smart contract platform that enables this sort of rich ecosystem of applications. Now, when we talk about cryptocurrencies, there are some implications here in terms of um, how to think of them as an investor or in a trading portfolio. And from a regulatory or tax perspective, there are big questions. And I want to borrow um, an illustration from David Hoffman, who wrote this article called Ether, the Triple Point Asset, where he uses, uh, he, he puts traditional assets like equities, bonds, real estate, fine art into these three categories, or they have these three characteristics. For example, capital assets tend to be things where you can generate interest or yield from them. They can put, you can put your money to work. Consumable assets are things that you might spend or consume for some purpose. For example, gold can be consumed to in manufacturing. And then some assets, for example, also gold, can simply be used as stores of value where you're, you're trusting that um, by owning that asset, you're going to be able to get the value back when you need it. And when you look at something like Ethereum, it doesn't fit perfectly into these existing categories. In fact, it kind of touches on all three of these. So if you tie up your ETH in a bond by staking it in order to become a network operator and collect um, payments from the network and, and revenue for doing that job, then you can maybe look at ETH as a capital asset. For example, you can also spend ETH as a consumer, and that's more of a consumable um, characteristic. So basically, when you look at um, mainstream media trying to get their heads around crypto and you look at what regulators are, are currently doing, there's a lot of disagreement over who has jurisdiction, are these tokens securities or commodities, um, what kinds of disclosures are needed. And it's really kind of the Wild West right now. And like tax guidance is practically non-existent. And if you take something like the Howey test to determine if a particular crypto token is a security, you'll probably get different results based on which token you're looking at. So it's probably not even realistic to apply a single treatment to all of crypto as an asset class. It, there's going to need to be more definition um, throughout the ecosystem, maybe subcategories. Okay, so moving on from currencies and tokens specifically, I wanna talk about applications. And in crypto, at this point in time, there are really three big application spaces. Um, one application space that isn't listed here is payments. That's kind of crypto's original use case, is being able to send money to anyone at, anywhere in the world for any reason. Um, but that's kind of a closed book at this point, and it is, payments are big in crypto. But most of the innovation happening right now is around decentralized finance or DeFi, non-fungible tokens or NFTs, and decentralized autonomous organizations or DAOs. So I'm going to talk about each one of these and, and just try to give you examples and explain what they are. So this graphic is pretty overwhelming. Um, this is kind of the DeFi ecosystem as of, I think, April. And... Uh, let's zoom in on the middle row here called the DeFi primitive layer. And there are these like four columns within this row, and they kind of represent the four main categories of DeFi. And if you look at the bottom, you can see the market caps of each of those to get an idea of kind of how big they are. So the first category here on the left is um, DEXs or decentralized exchange exchanges. So as opposed to um, a centralized exchange where you have market makers who have order books and um, there are big players providing liquidity on the back end of that in order to enable um, traders to, to transact on their exchange. In contrast to that, something like Uniswap allows anybody to deposit liquidity. So I can deposit 
like a US dollar equivalent and an Ethereum uh, token, I can deposit, say, $500 of liquidity. And as people use the exchange, I collect fees from those transactions. Okay, so those are decentralized exchanges. Um, anybody can participate as a consumer or as a liquidity provider. Lending in crypto is generally fully collateralized. So um, there's no credit in crypto. Everybody's generally anonymous. So if you want to borrow money, then you typically need to fully collateralize it. And that's where you get platforms like Aave and Maker. Moving over to derivatives, you have familiar derivatives like options, um, perpetual contracts, and then you also have more crypto-oriented derivatives like liquid staking derivatives, which are kind of analogous to using treasury bonds as collateral. So if I'm posting a bond to stake my ether and participate in the network as an, as an operator, then I can actually um, use certain methods of, to do that where I get an IOU back or I basically get um, like a, a placeholder token, but then I can use that token as collateral to do other things in DeFi and I can borrow against it. And I touched on stable coins before. Um, the main idea here is to point out that the market cap for stable coins is very, very big. Um, in some ways, stable coins are considered like a killer app of crypto. And by bridging dollars into um, blockchains, you can now use them in the context of all these other applications. So you can use them in exchanges for lending. You can use them with these different derivative applications and so on. Now, because DeFi applications are open source software that are that is data that's published directly onto the blockchain, onto the ledger, there's a record of it. Anybody can interact with it. Anybody can use it. They don't need to ask for permission. So if I create some kind of smart contract that does really interesting things and I publish that, anybody can build new features and new applications around um, that application. And so you get some interesting like composability in DeFi, where this is just one example from an app called DeFi Saver where basically what you're doing here is um, if you're borrowing $15,000 against 30 ETH tokens, and then you're taking that $15,000 and you're depositing it, you're depositing it into another um, application called Compound and getting interest from that. So at the same time, you are exposed to ETH by holding those tokens, but you're borrowing against them and then collecting interest off of the borrowed funds. And this is basically one click using this tool. And just touching on those characteristics of um, smart contracts and, and these applications being composable, they're composable because they're permissionless and sort of by default, anybody has access to them on this decentralized blockchain. And the point here is that um, this is starting to look a lot like some of the reasons why the internet blew up the way that it did. And at this point in time, what we're seeing is that um, blockchain networks, they're starting to standardize more and more on Ethereum, kind of in the way that the internet all standardized on a common protocol known as TCP IP. So a, a winner is kind of emerging at the moment. And then what, what that's doing is we're crossing this inflection point where we're getting to, to a point where investors and builders are able to sort of rapidly scale up applications because the underlying technology is getting more stable. It's able to handle that scale. So in some ways, like 2022, 2021, to some extent, might be where the pivot for like hockey stick growth actually is if crypto is sort of destined to be something um, quite large. Okay, so that was DeFi. Now I wanna talk about NFTs.
which have been a hot topic in kind of mainstream reporting about crypto. And um, in order to understand what NFTs are, I'm just going to quickly define fungibility. So fungible things are like dollars, corn, bonds. It's anything where if you have one of them, you can trade it with another one and it's it's all the same to you. There's really no inherent difference between one dollar versus another. Non-fungible things are unique in that if I trade a baseball card with you, I maybe have something worth more or less or something I like more or less. Um, my car is non-fungible in that if I trade it for another car, maybe my car had some dents, this one doesn't, that kind of thing. So non-fungible tokens are basically like any other crypto token, except that instead of a supply of many, many of a token, there's just one unique token, which basically means there's one unique record of something that exists on the blockchain. And where NFTs have been really popular is with these like profile picture um, projects where you get outrageous sales of like millions of, of dollars for uh, a picture of a monkey that anybody can right click and save to their computer. And what I want to convey here is that like the graphic um, for, for like Jimmy Fallon's profile picture or whoever it is, the, the image itself isn't the NFT. The NFT is the record on the blockchain that says, this is a piece of data that is maybe associated with an image or maybe not, but it's defined by this smart contract on the blockchain and it has this owner. And so some analogs for this are like um, a collectible that comes with its own certificate of authenticity or NFTs can be membership cards into gated communities. So maybe you have to actually possess one of these monkeys and be able to prove that you own it in order to access um, a private chat server or even like a VIP section in an, a live concert. Um, or maybe having an NFT entitles you to something. You have rights to dividends from a fund or something like that. So it's really more of like the membership card and the proof of ownership than anything else and the rights that, that come with that that tend to give NFTs value. Um, I'll just give one example, one more example about NFTs, which is that um, the musical artists, the Chainsmokers, they dropped an album and they did an NFT giveaway when they dropped their album. And 5,000 of their fans who received an album NFT suddenly had equity share in their album and were able to collect 1% of the royalties generated by the album. So just by owning the NFT, they were entitled to um, some portion of revenue from the album. And in the future, you can imagine real world assets being bridged onto the blockchain where you might, you might have something like your house title um, tokenized as an NFT. And if you sell that, then that could be transfer, transferring ownership of your house to somebody else. The last application space here to talk about is DAOs or decentralized um, organizations. One kind of fun example that happened, um, I guess it was last year, is this group called the Constitution DAO. It was a group of people that came out of nowhere and, and decided, hey, we want to pool our money together and bid on one of the original 13 copies of the US Constitution that still remain. So Sotheby's had an auction for a copy of the Constitution, and they basically started selling equity into this fund that they were raising capital for to go to this auction house and bid on the constitution. And ultimately they lost the auction by a sliver, but they were able to raise $47 million. And I just thought that was really interesting. And um, DAOs, so like a way to think about DAOs is as digital cooperatives. So generally members of the DAOs, they own um, equity, in the DAO. And if you want to compare the DAO to like a business, it's it's a perfectly flat structure. Um, nobody has power over anybody else. It's all decisions are basically all put to vote where anybody can propose um, a vote and then the community will 
have some kind of consensus threshold where if enough people agree, then they execute that vote. And that might look something like this. Um, there, so there are tools where people can use their NFTs to sort of sign in and then cast their votes. And um, this is how things tend to happen in DAOs. One large DAO, one of the biggest DAOs is called the Index Cooperative. And they're an investment fund. They have um, about half a billion dollars in assets under management. And they've elected seven community members who kind of set the long-term strategy of their fund, but they've hired dozens of employees. So from the outside, they kind of look like any business, but from the inside, it's actually just this collection of random people. So um, at this point, we kind of have like a pretty good picture of what the crypto space looks like. And I just want to touch on a few miscellaneous things. So if you were going to go from here directly to your nearest exchange and start buying crypto tokens, a few things to point out in terms of trading are that crypto tokens are very risk on. They're, they tend to be like the, the first things to sell off in a market downturn, which is what we saw recently. Um, almost all crypto tokens correlate to some extent and follow the biggest market cap um, tokens, which are Bitcoin and Ethereum. So if you want to get a read on kind of how the crypto market is doing, you can usually just look at Bitcoin and Ethereum. Um, tokens in crypto are generally very high volatility. So if you're looking for something to trade, that's very volatile where you can make a lot of money really fast, but also have a lot of risk. Uh, crypto can be great for that. Crypto tokens are subject to complex system dynamics. So it's really important that you know exactly what you're buying. For example, um, you know, because tokens each essentially have their own monetary policy programmed into them, you can have tokens where the supply is inflating at like a at an extremely rapid rate. And so you're getting debased pretty much every single day that you're holding that token, unless you're on the other side of that debasement and capturing some of the currency that's getting minted and, and divvied up. And that can happen through staking. So for example, in the Cosmos blockchain ecosystem, it's very typical for um, holders of those tokens to buy the tokens and then stake them so that they're getting they're both getting debased rapidly, but they're also collecting a lot of the newly minted tokens. I know it's kind of weird, but the point here is just know what you're buying. Um, be aware that, as I said, regulatory like guidance is in progress and anything could happen. So um, there's risk associated with that. And as I said before, when people say like 99% of crypto is a scam, like that's probably true. So um, that doesn't, I, I don't think that invalidates the other 1% of like meaningful innovation, but just do your research before you dive in. So going forward in crypto, just a few areas to watch. Um, we talked about what DAOs are. The specific mechanisms or methods by which DAOs govern themselves, that's evolving rapidly, like voting methods and hierarchical structures within DAOs and how uh, decisions actually get executed. That's something to keep an eye on um, this year. Gaming has a huge market cap and a lot of investors are kind of expecting crypto to bite off some large chunk of the gaming market. Public goods and ESG is a big topic in crypto. You can do interesting things. For example, one exchange called SushiSwap is partnering with a project called Klima who tokenizes carbon credits. And if you use the Sushi exchange to say convert Bitcoin tokens to Ethereum tokens, you can check a box that says, take a little bit larger fee and offset my carbon footprint in this transaction. So the composability of that, I think is interesting and could have some interesting um, implications down the road. Traditional finance is getting more and more on board with crypto. And what you're starting to see are like some banking products that look like typical consumer banking products, but they're using crypto rails on the back end, maybe in order to get um, more capital efficiency out of that money and offer, for example, higher interest rates. So I would keep an eye out for that. 
Um, a lot of companies are investing in supply chains and trying to use blockchains in order to increase transparency. I think Walmart is heavily invested in a chain called VeChain. And then if you want to get into the really technical stuff, there are all kinds of topics like how do you prove that um, a person on a blockchain is a, is a real person and not one of 20,000 like false um, identities? Um, how do you do privacy on blockchains? What kind of architectures are most scalable and make the most sense in the long run? And how do you achieve scaling in general? And this is the kind of final idea I'll throw out at you as, as sort of an interesting hypothetical, logical extreme. Like if you're all in on crypto and you think it's going to completely transform the world, like this is what that might look like, maybe. Um, and this comes from um, an author, I can't remember his name, who wrote this book called The Network State. And there's a website, thenetworkstate.com. And he describes the network state as this hypothetical um, community where the community is highly aligned, it's online, and it has this capacity for collective action. And they actually crowdfund territory around the world and eventually gain diplomatic recognition from pre-existing states. So if you take an example of like the Constitution DAO, what if instead of raising um, $50 million, they raised $50 billion and their citizens were all around the world and they started buying up land and basically went to sovereign um, nation states and said, hey, we want a seat at the table and we want to we want you to recognize us as a, a sovereign state. So it's kind of out there, but there are people in crypto who are really kind of thinking about this as their end goal. And whether they achieve that or not, I think it's going to be a pretty interesting experiment. If you want to learn more, um, just a couple of resources that I use to sort of, I, I use as jumping off points are there's a very small community on Reddit called ETH Finance. And every day they have a discussion thread called the daily discussion thread. And if you just kind of linger in there and see what people are talking about, you'll find links to all kinds of interesting research and projects and um, discussion. So I really recommend that. And a similar kind of community that's more more of like a chat room experience is the Rocket Pool community, which is a project that's sort of closely aligned with um, Ethereum. And there's a, a channel in that Discord server called Trading where people are super friendly and basically will teach you anything you want to know. And um, if you want to consume either podcasts or videos, the Bankless um, organization puts out like tons of content every single week and they're generally interviewing uh, really key people and they're on they're sort of paying attention to the cutting edge of crypto and and so that's not a bad option too so at this point um i don't know we can open it up for questions feel free to dump questions in the chat um, or we can take them live over voice and i'm happy to try to answer those and um yeah other than that you can find me on twitter if you want to send me a message directly and i'm happy to explain more about crypto or try to point you in the right direction. Hey, Tim, we have a lot of traders in our community. So just wondering if you could just touch on uh, trading crypto. I know it's 24 seven, but um, any, uh, any observations you've had from actually trading the crypto itself? Um, yeah, so I'll give you my, I'll do my best here. Um, as somebody that's more of a longer term investor than a trader, but some of the observations I've seen are that um, you get really big drawdowns in crypto. So if you can, if you can handle it, um, looking at like zooming out basically and looking at the really big trends and seeing historically where the drawdowns are compared to in the past, there are a lot of tools for this. Um, I'm just going to try to pull one up really quick. So there are tools like this that basically put price action on a logarithmic trend or, or scale. And 
give you signals for like, based on the mechanics of the blockchain and how the monetary policy is changing, um, you might see big swings up and down. And so there are a lot of people that are paying attention to these kinds of charts. And, you know, this can take years to play out, but you might spend one year where you're investing really heavily. And then you might spend another year where you're um, rolling that back into cash or some other kind of um, asset. So that's the first thing I'd point out is that unlike the S&P 500, you're probably going to experience a lot more pain if you try to approach crypto as like um, with, with the mindset of like an index fund investor. So th there's that observation. Another one is like you pointed out, crypto markets are 24 seven. Um, on the weekends in particular, you can get really small volume. So you can get really erratic price movements. Um, so just watch out for that. Um, I had a couple more thoughts. Let me see if they come back to me. Are there options traded on any of these? I know most of those are option traders. Yeah, so options. Okay, so there are centralized exchanges that sell options. I think FTX is the biggest one in the US. And if you're outside of the US, you can use Deribit, which has um, a lot more volume. So options can sometimes be hard to find in large volume in crypto, especially if you're looking at really niche tokens. Um, but Deribit and FTX are generally pretty okay. And then within DeFi, um, decentralized finance, you have platforms like Lyra is probably the premier one right now. Lyra Finance. The thing about Lyra is that their options are generally on a shorter time frame. So you're looking for expirations that are like a couple of months out and not like six to 12 months out. Um, but you can definitely do some interesting things with options. Now, there was a question from Robert. He says, discuss the role of miners in something, the quality limit of Bitcoins. Maybe it was a typo. Um, maybe did, I guess the role of miners, maybe that's a, a good way to start. Sure. Um, just going back to the two consensus method mechanisms that I mentioned, proof of work versus proof of stake. Remember proof of work is the Bitcoin method for the network to achieve consensus where network operators are solving hard math problems in order to prove that their um, incentives are aligned with the network. In order for them to prove those hard math problems, they're doing heavy computations on computers and that's what uh, mining actually is. So when, you, when somebody refers to a crypto miner, they're talking about somebody who's probably buying like stacks of um, computers optimized for this task and just having them crank out um, these, these computations, which are basically buying them lottery tickets to win large amounts of Bitcoin. And I'm not sure about the other part of the question. If there's a, if there's a specific like question about miners, I'm happy to take a stab at it. Um, okay. He, he clarified, he said the quantity or fixed number of coins. Yes. So, okay. So this is like an area of debate between Bitcoin enthusiasts and non-Bitcoin enthusiasts, or maybe Ethereum enthusiasts, which I fall more into the Ethereum camp. So one of the touted benefits or, or properties of Bitcoin is that the supply of Bitcoin will never exceed 21 million tokens ever. And what that means is you can expect that your uh, any Bitcoins you hold, they're not going to get debased by monetary supply inflation. Um, the problem with that is you can't continuously, so the network itself can't continuously print new Bitcoins and hand them out to miners to pay them for doing all of this expensive um, network operating. It, it can't continue to print Bitcoin um, any more than um, basically, basically the rewards that miners get paid, they get cut in half every four years. And that eventually causes the supply to converge 
to 21 million. But because miners are getting paid half as many tokens for doing the same job, Bitcoin basically needs to double in price for it to still have the same value to those miners. So if you think Bitcoin is going to double in price every four years forever, then you can assume Bitcoin miners will continue to find mining profitable. But if you think that's not going to happen, and eventually miners are going to get paid so little Bitcoin that they're going to lose interest and leave the network, then what happens is you have fewer people operating that network, and that makes it easier for another, another player with a lot of money to come in and dominate um, the network with a majority. So that puts the network at risk. And there's kind of this open question about whether or not the Bitcoin community is going to find a way out of this corner they've sort of painted themselves into. But the thing is that they have at least 10 years, maybe closer to 20 years, probably to figure this out. And so I, I don't think it's like an urgent problem being addressed within the Bitcoin community, but it is a question that's sort of raised a lot when people are considering um, sort of who's who has the keys to the future. Um, I had a question. I read something about the merge, but I guess it was Ethereum. Do you know if that's happened or um, what what that means? Yes. Um, so the merge happened in mid September, so about a month ago. And this is something that the Ethereum um, network has been planning for years, and it's basically been getting delayed. But what it is is switching off of that proof of work consensus mechanism that uh, Bitcoin still uses to the proof of stake consensus mechanism, where instead of doing hard math problems to prove that you're aligned, you post a bond of Ethereum tokens. And that shift in um, architecture of the blockchain, that's, that's where we got those like 15 nuclear reactors of energy demand just like went away overnight when Ethereum switched over to proof of stake. And in addition to reducing the energy demands of um, the Ethereum network, proof of stake also came with sort of monetary supply changes that, that don't inflate the monetary supply as much. Like it's often deflationary depending on market conditions. And the reason for that is you don't need to pay as much money or as much revenue out to the people running the network when they don't have super high costs. Because in order to um, be a network operator in a proof of stake environment, you need a very lightweight computer to do the actual computing part of the job. And <clears throat> um, in instead of spending lots of money on a mining rig to solve math problems, you're spending a little bit of money on a computer and you're taking your money, most of your money, and you're bonding it as a stake in the network. So hopefully that makes sense. But basically it means that those operators don't have very high costs, which means um, less of the revenue that the network generates is paid out to network operators, which means that the if you're holding Ethereum tokens, you're not getting uh, debased as much and it's maybe storing value better. All right. There's I don't see any more questions and we're, we're we like to stop these around an hour and we're pretty close to that. So this seems like a good place to stop. So Tim, really uh, appreciate coming on and uh, giving us the lowdown on crypto and what some of these terms mean, like the blockchain, et cetera. So really appreciate your expertise and being willing to share it. Absolutely. Hope it was helpful. Um, thanks for having me. All right. Well, thanks, everyone. Uh, I can set up an email, Tim, at aramir.com. If you want to send Tim any questions, that might be an easy way to do it. It'll just forward right to you, Tim. So um, if you have anything... Uh, things you don't understand uh, Tim knows uh, quite a bit about this so again really appreciate coming on and everybody coming to attend and if you're watching the recording um, you know just uh, let us know what you think so thanks Tim really appreciate it absolutely thanks all right take care see you, everyone yep